All right, looking this morning at the Gospel of John, chapter 21, looking at verse 21 and 22. And it says this, Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, But Lord, what about this man? <laughs> Jesus said to him, If I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Amen. Powerful, yes? <laughs> when you look at verse 21, and it says, Peter seeing him, he's not talking about Peter seeing Jesus. Yes? He's talking about Peter looking to John, the writer of the gospel, and he's got a concern and a question that is stirred in his heart. And he says, Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, looking right at Jesus, calls him Lord, and then says, what about this man? He's, Peter's got all kinds of concerns here. But of course, Peter just heard a powerful word said to him. Peter just heard this word saying to him that in verse 18, Most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger you girded yourself and walked up where you wished, but when you are old you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. Verse 19, This he spoke signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this he said to him, Follow me. Peter just found out how he's going to die in the end. Imagine hearing today, oh, this is what's going to take place. Peter just found out he's going to be stretched out like Jesus. He's going to be crucified just like that. He hears that word. He hears this powerful word straight from the Lord. And I don't know, do you think Peter believes it? Do you think that Peter trusted in the Lord's word at this time? He didn't question it in the sense of that's what's going to happen. It's like, well, you just heard this. What do you do? How do you respond to something like that? You just heard this word from the Lord of how, when you were young, you did basically, you went and went, did whatever you want, but now, when you get old, you're gonna go where you do not wish. And this is what's gonna happen to you. And it's like, you know, like deer in the headlights, and you just heard this powerful word, and he's like, what do you say, what do you do? I know what I'll do, I'll deflect. What about this man? <laughs> and how often times that's what people do? Is that the word of the Lord just came and hit your heart, hit your mind, hit your life, hit your soul. In your time past, you did basically whatever you wanted to do, but now you're going to be going to the cross. What do I do with that? What about this man? Immediately deflect to this, to that, to all the other things that might be. And Jesus says in verse 19, follow me. But now when he says, what about, what about this man? And he goes through that deflection. Verse 22, Jesus gives him kind of like that strong uh, rebuke, a little nudge back. He, he, he puts his hand out basically and nudges Peter back into place. Wakes him up and awakes him in such a way. He says, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? And this time he adds, he doesn't just say, follow me. What does he say? You. You. Follow me. He makes it very pointed. He all of a sudden now takes out his spear, takes out his sword, takes out his arrow. He takes out the word of God and says, you. It makes it very pointed. No longer just the generic follow me as he said all many times in time past to others as he called them to be, to be disciples. He's now speaking directly to Peter's heart, directly to Peter's life, directly to you and me. That's the title of today's sermon, you follow me. And we must understand that this is not a suggestion. Jesus is not talking as the loving Lamb of God, as many people would like to portray him in such a way that he has no bite. True. See, a lamb has no bite. This lamb has bite. You can go up to a lamb all day long. Your child can go up to a lamb and say, Oh, no, no, stay away. The, he might bite you or nip you or, or he might, the lamb <laughs> might gum you. <laughs> but this lamb has bite. And when he points and he says, You, he's pointing to your heart and to my heart and every heart that calls himself a saint. And he's not making this a suggestion, it's a command, and it's not just a command, it's a ultra command. It's a foundational command, 
And in this, you find that command comes forth. And notice that Jesus doesn't wait for an answer. You know, sometimes you say something to someone and now you're looking. Like, when you talk to, and you're like, you capiche? You know, get, get it, agree, understand? He doesn't look for Peter's capiche. Yeah? He doesn't look for you. Do you understand, Peter, like what I'm saying? Does he go down that road of explaining and, and parable? Does this sound like a parable? This is a three-word statement of you follow me. No parable needed. No turning of explaining and what do you mean by that and I'm not sure and how come it's this way and Peter tried to get it to be about John. <laughs> John and I have been in ministry here for, for three years hand in hand and uh, maybe we could and uh, nope. He makes it very pointed and whatever I do with him that's between him and me. And whatever I do with you is between you and me. Amen. There's the command. Amen. You follow me. And he's not looking for some sort of uh, response of agreement. He's not looking for, uh, are we on the same page? He's not looking for consensus. He doesn't call the other disciples and say, uh, is everybody okay with this? He doesn't, you follow me. In these three words contain the gospel. If you don't know anything or ever gain anything more out of any sermon I've ever preached or any sermon that I've ever teaching that's out there or any book that's written or anybody else, here's the gospel right here. You follow me. Here it is. I don't know what else to say. I don't know what else to do. I, I, do, I have a hard time. Here it is. You follow me. That's what it comes down to. Notice that there's still only two parties involved in this relationship. It's the you and me team. I, I say that to care on a regular basis. So it's the you and me team. I thought about ever starting a business, I'll call it the you and me team. I'll do the thinking, she does the work. <laughs> you and me. That's the relationship you have with Jesus. It's you and him. You and me. Jesus is speaking to him from the very heartbeat of God's throne room as the resurrected Christ soon to ascend. And he's speaking directly to me as he did in 1989. And he's speaking to you. You follow me. This word has come forth right from the heartbeat of God. And it went beyond just the generic verse 19, follow me. It now is you follow me. When Jesus first came onto the scene and was empowered by the Holy Spirit and he was calling forth his disciples in Matthew chapter 4 verse 20, it says they immediately left their nets and followed him. Immediately left their nets. All that they used to do when they regarded themselves as Jesus just told Peter and went about doing their business as they want, where they want, how they want, raising business, I'm going to go to work, I'm going to, like Peter says, I'm going fishing. How many times over Peter's life did he say, I'm going fishing? Come on, uh, Andrew, let's, let's go fishing. Come on, John James, a uh, fellow fisherman, let's go fishing. And now it's, you're going to go where you don't want to go. You're going to end up doing what you don't want to do. But you're, all of a sudden you realize that Jesus, is the, by the Holy Spirit, is going to do something in Peter's life. That he's going to want to serve him with his whole heart, mind, and soul. Peter has no idea what's waiting for him. Peter, by hearing this word, you follow me, has no idea uh, what, the, uh, what the ascension is going to look like. He, that hasn't happened yet. He's, he doesn't see himself on the Mount of Olives. He, he doesn't see himself in the, in the upper room uh, saying, well, the word of God, and he's speaking the word of God, and we have to choose another. He doesn't see that yet. He doesn't all of a sudden see tongues of flames of fire falling on head, speaking tongues, speaking to thousands and three thousand. He doesn't see any of that yet. He doesn't see himself in front of the Pharisees, Sadducees, and giving an account. He doesn't see the power and boldness. He doesn't see him and John rejoicing for being beaten up because they are serving the Lord and speaking his name and teaching. He doesn't see any of that. But he does have this, a three-word a three, a three command. You follow me. That's what he does have. And that's what you have. And that's what I have. That has come forth in the Holy Spirit as saw fit out of all the words and deeds that have been done by the Holy Spirit in the church through the apostles and disciples. Here you and I have captured these three words that contain the gospel message. Let's follow him. 
coming to that place where it says in Matthew chapter 4, verse 22, two verses beyond the first one that we said, and immediately they left their boat, the boat and their father and followed him. What did they leave? They left that boat, they left the nets, they left their father. Can you imagine what the father was thinking when this all happened? You're doing what? You're going where? You're leaving? You, you're going to leave me with all this work? Oh, how, how Mr. Luther hated when Martin Luther decided to go into the monastery. Oh my. Mr. Luther did not like son Luther not doing what father Luther wanted him to do. Can't you be this and can't you be that? Something productive for society? Luther had no idea. Martin Luther had no idea he was going to come against all this Catholicism that was, that was ruining lives. That he's going to come against the very throne seat of Satan, as he said. But he left their boat, left the nets, and left their father. It's always involved leaving. Leaving behind the rubbish. Leaving behind the natural relationships. Leaving behind the lust of this world. Leaving behind the lust of the heart. Leaving behind our own ways. As he said earlier when Jesus was speaking to Peter, I mean, when you were younger you did basically as you wanted to do, but no longer. You now are yoked with me. You are now carrying out the business of the Lord. Letting go of the old, letting go in the, throwing out the rubbish. Remember that sermon I preached, removing the rubbish. Getting rid of all those old relationships or the old attitudes. Or what do you think, dear, about those old attitudes? Remember the, uh, uh, mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Got to throw them out, right? Got to all of a sudden come to that place where it's time to remove the rubbish, the rubbish of the mind, the rubbish of the heart. Hey, I know I was a landfill. I, all, I know what this rubbish business looks like. This guy was a landfill, layer upon layers of rubbish. Because when I removed that top layer, I thought I was all set. <laughs> Go down a few inches of soil, a whole nother layer. The pride, the lust, the, 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 the. Come into that place where you finally find the foundation called Jesus Christ. You finally find the cornerstone. You finally find the one where you can build a life that's immovable, where that contains the living hope. And you say, there he is. Here he is building his life in my life, my life belonging to him. Come into that place where all of a sudden you realize that I can follow him, leaving the old behind. The old relationships of father, nets and fishing and doing whatever I wished and how I want. I'm going fishing, I'm going hunting, I'm going here, I'm going there. Let's take a vacation, let's take a cruise, let's go do what we want, let's do whatever we want. Let's drink, let's eat, let's be merry, let's watch TV, let's have this, let's have that. It's all fun. Hey, and, I, and all of a sudden you realize that all that conduct you did, whatever you wanted to do, all of a sudden changed. I have something else planned for you. But beyond the cross is the living hope. Beyond the cross is the consecrated life. Built by the cross of Jesus Christ where you deny yourself, where Peter did not wish to go. The cross of Jesus Christ solves all your problems. Amen. When Jesus came to Matthew, chapter 9 of Matthew, and Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. That was the greatest day for every taxpayer. All those that were in line all of a sudden said, <laughs> the tax man walks away, gotta like it. But Matthew did what? He did it. But here in John, you follow me. Because the minute we come up with our yabats, our deflections, our excuses, our explanations, our reasons, our what about, and all of the other things of why we maybe can't, and why we can't come to church, and why we can't have a relationship, and how come it's difficult, to, and it gets rid of all of the yeah buts, and you know what's, and the how about thems, and not your ways, and all of these things that come and plague us, it gets rid of every single one of them, because you are now going to build a relationship with the you and me team. Point to yourself, point to Jesus, you and me. And the link is only through the cross of Jesus Christ and only by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
To follow means a relationship has been established. To follow means a relationship has just been established. Where there was no relationship with Jesus Christ, there was no relationship with the Holy Spirit, there was no relationship with the Father in heaven. He was basically just, I understood God in heaven, and someday I was going to go to him. No idea how all that took place. Didn't care. I was a decent person, nice person, according to my own standards, doing very well. But all of a sudden you come and you hit Jesus and he hits you with you follow me and the relationship has been established. In other words, the relationship is this, not your way, my way. That's the relationship that's best established, not your way, my way. You're going to follow the ways of the Lord and he just told Peter and this is the way, pick up your cross, follow me. The relationship is this, no more but what about. Get rid of the yeah, what abouts. Get rid of the how abouts. Get rid of the if onlys. Get rid of the what ifs. And get going with what Pastor Adam says with the let's go. Instead of trying to always uh, get away and do nothing, it's get up and do something. Oh, so many are plagued with the I just got to get away from it all. I just got to do nothing. Instead of the get up and do something. That we ought to, God Almighty would put a zeal in our hearts for the do something. All of a sudden you find that relationship, all other attractions grow strangely dim. God's doing a work in your life. All those things that once attracted you, like a bass looking at a lure. All those things that the devil has thrown out in front of you that you seek and chase after. All that live bait that comes that has a hook in it. All that harlotry that is in the world all of a sudden has lost its appeal. In all the attractions of the world, you start seeing it for what it is. The rubbish is being thrown out. You start seeing relationships where they really are because you're now establishing a relationship with Jesus Christ. The one that you cannot see now lives in your heart. The one that you cannot touch, you now feel him, the impulse of his love motivating your heart. The one that you cannot smell, you smell the aroma of his, of his presence. The one that you cannot hear, you hear pounding in your heart, your mind and your soul. I must. And you hear, follow me. All distractions start losing all of their influence, their sway. All these distractions. All these people that are demanding your time and all these people that are demanding your affections and all these people that are demanding your attention. All of a sudden you have another who has captivated you all. All your attention and all your attraction and no longer distracted because you're maturing in Jesus Christ. Amen. Just like Charles Finney when he was called and he came out of the woods where he met with the Lord and the Lord moved powerfully and he was baptized in the spirit and he was a lawyer and he used to try a case and he's going into the courtroom and the fellow starts asking him about, about or he's walking by the courtroom and the fellow says, are you ready for my court case? He goes, no, nope, no, I'm done with it. <laughs> I'm done with it. I'm not going to court anymore. I'm not going into courtroom. I'm not defending. I'm not doing any more attorney business. I have another case to try. I have another, another case to present. I have something else. And he became evangelist. They moved mightily here in the Northeast. Amen. That all of a sudden, all these attractions and distractions lose their power and their sway. The Bible says that those who are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Follow me. You follow me is filled with the sons of God who hear and obey. Hear and yield. Hear and follow. Want to know the truth and want the truth alive in their hearts. Want to do things God's will, God's word, God's way. To follow is to obey and learn from the one who called you to follow. When you, will, when you hear, you follow me. It's not just a relationship. It's a relationship that obeys and learns from the one who called you. Just as Samuel was a boy when he said, yes, Lord, here I am. Your servant hears. I hear Samuel heard the voice of God and became God's man even as a boy. Samuel became God's man even as a boy. Yes, Lord, your servant hears. The most powerful response you can have Yes, Lord. 
And it's not just words. And it can't be just words. Just as with Peter, Jesus didn't wait for a response to say, Yes, Lord. The yes will show up in his steps. The yes will show up in his decisions. The yes will show up in everything he says and does. That's where your yes lies. Yes only can't be just words. That is to testify, but it must show up in everything we seek, everything we say, everything we do in Jesus' name. This is a call and a command from heaven's throne to surrender, submit, and serve the one you follow. Yes, Lord. Greek philosophers used to have disciples. Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, all the other ones and all the ones that are not known, they would have disciples. And those disciples would follow them. And they became known as ones who followed after Aristotle, after Plato, after Socrates, who they followed. They became known as their disciples. They stayed with them. They learned from them. They learned their ways. They learned their teachings. They learned their words. And they became known as that sect that follows this one. The sect that follows this one. The sect that follows this one. That organization that followed. Well, I'm a follower of Plato and I'm a follower. And Paul comes and approaches the Corinthians and says that, well, we're followers of Paul and we're followers. He goes, what are you thinking? We're followers of who? Jesus Christ. Hence, Christian. Ones who follow. We're not the modern Christianity today that just sing songs, post some memes, and basically live our own lives as, as whatever we've done in time past. We probably cleaned up our language and don't watch maybe what we used to. But basically, that's it. But you follow me has kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of gone aside. But to follow me means no lagging behind and no stepping beyond. You're called to follow him. No stepping behind. No stepping beyond and no lagging behind. To hear, to know, to trust, to live unto Christ is to obey him. Peter was now going to follow him. Peter before could not get past the courtyard, remember? Peter before could not get past the courtyard and the only thing that actually drew him into the courtyard was curiosity and a warm fire. That's actually what brought him. And I've seen many get drawn to say MVC, drawn to the parking lot, drawn to the hallway, drawn to the fellowship, drawn to the hugs, drawn to where you're welcome, drawn to, to the chairs, even drawn eventually coming to the altar and drawn and, and moved and say, yes, I want this. Yep. Till this comes knocking on your door and he says, you follow me. And he becomes very pointed. And he directs it right to your heart. And he doesn't wait for, 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 for us to get to a certain age. He's pointing right to all the young ones, even all the young ones in the back now. He's calling upon them to follow him. Because if you're not following him, then you're following something that is not him. If we're not following the living God, we're not following the Holy Spirit, we're not following his word, his teachings, his doctrine, then we're following somebody or something, some spirit that's not him. So it's either the Holy Spirit or it's an unholy spirit that's leading your life, stirring your affections, drawing your attractions, gaining your, your attention. Who is that? What is that? It must be truth. Amen? It must be the Holy Spirit. Now we could say, yes, I'll follow him. Yes, I'm going to do that. I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what he says. Just like the Hebrews did it in time past, when they got Mount Sinai, remember? And, the, and Moses conveys all of the law, all the word to them, says this is what the God would, and they just hear it all. And they respond, all that he said we will do. Is that not right? And that lasted how long? Not long. A day or two? All, all that he said we will do, we'll follow him, we'll do what he said. Because you cannot do it without the grace of God. You cannot do it without the heart that comes from God. We can say, yes, I'll follow you. Yes, Peter could have responded, yes, Lord, I'll follow you no matter where. I'll go to the cross. But without the grace of God, without the power of the living God in your heart, mind, and soul, you and I are going nowhere. All will be as like those rebellious Hebrews that did the things of God unto the false gods. That's all we'll do. And there's much of that going on in church world today doing all of the things that we call church, but they're doing it all to something that is not of the Lord. 
the singing of the songs and the giving of the money and supporting this and doing good things and yet the Holy Spirit and the call to Christ and the call for consecration, consecration is grossly missing. Yeah. Jesus said this, Matthew 10, 38, and he who does not take his cross, he who does not take his cross, here it is, Matthew chapter 10, 38, and he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Yep, that's the, the, the kind, loving lamb that everybody, here he is, with bite. The lamb with bite is right here. That this is not a suggestion. This is a call and a command from heaven's throne to take up your cross. See, everybody has fallen in love with the cross of Jesus Christ who did all these wonderful things and poured forth his life and the forgiveness of sins, but everybody despises and brings contempt to the cross that he has for you and I. There's a cross for you and I too. It's the cross of Jesus Christ that he's calling for you and I also to pick up and follow. The cross that denies self and our own sense of rudeness. The cross that comes into our life and prefers others instead of ourselves. The cross that has the love of God uh, formulated and bubbling in your life. The cross of Christ that comes and moves you to do His will and not your own will. The cross that delivers you from doing all your own things and now doing His cares and concerns. And the cross that says, I cast my cares upon you because I know you care for me. It's picking up His cares and concerns and giving Him your cares and concerns. Jesus said to them, learn of me. You cannot learn of Jesus Christ except by the grace of God. Learn of me. Jesus said, learn of me. He didn't say learn from me. He didn't say learn for me. He said, learn of me. It comes to a place where you hear his words and you want to learn of who he is. How he responds, what his actions are, what his thoughts are. He's given you the mind of Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. He wants to teach you his precepts and his statutes and all that he is and he's calling for you to follow him as he followed the Father. As Jesus was led by the Spirit, he's calling for you and I to be led by the Spirit. And when we fall short, and we do, then all those times that as we work towards perfection, the Holy Spirit will come and empower you to live one more, one more day, one more time, one more breath, one more step, one more decision for Jesus Christ. Don't be fooled. Do not be fooled. To follow him is not just arbitrarily or superficially saying, yes, I'll follow. As we just sang, yes, I will. And we can sing that song between now and Jesus comes and say, yes, I will. Yes, I will. And it's encouraging to the soul. Amen. But if it doesn't show up in the feet and in the hands and in the mouth and in the life and in the decisions, then it fell short and it was just pretense. Just pretense. Don't be fooled. Don't be deceived. God is calling for our yes, I will in everything we say and do. Well, you don't know what I did. You don't know what's going on in my life. You don't know the troubles I'm seeing. You don't, I know all about it. Layers of rubbish, remember? And now all you're dealing with is your layers of rubbish. That's all it is. That's all you and I are dealing with. That's all anybody's ever dealing with is your layers of rubbish. Landfill rubbish that has to be dealt with to get to the cornerstone called Jesus Christ and build something fresh and new. God Almighty came to them at Mount Sinai and spoke the word of God to them. All that you command, we will do. Nope. Nope. Didn't last at all. Didn't last at all. Why? No heart for it. Even the Psalms say that the Lord of glory is speaking through David the, the prophet and writing the Psalms. It says, did you really, when all those times in the wilderness, did you really, so you doing all the things that I commanded, were you, you were doing them for this God and that God and that demon and you were doing all those things because you had no heart for it. And God is calling for us to have his heart by the grace of God. Amen. You follow me. To follow him is a command to be his steward. To follow him is, to be a, is the command of God to be his steward. Interesting is that a steward really owns nothing. Have you noticed that a steward actually owns nothing? A steward just acts on behalf of the one who's the owner, the master. And with the master, you learn his way, you learn of him. You learn, as I said earlier, not from him or for him, those though they are there, but you learn of him. 
his cares, his concerns, what would he want done? The steward is there to learn the master's will and to do what he would want done. And can make fast decisions, easy decisions. I've seen people struggle with the will of God. Oh, I don't know what God wants me to do. It's really that, I've never had that problem. Because the minute you hear and know what he would have you to do, you just do it. And all those other, oh, well, I don't know, and uh, I'm suffering, and oh, stop it. Sure. Just do what he said, and all that goes away. Yeah. The cross takes care of all those problems. I've seen people always walking in depression. How? Because you, you won't deny yourself. See people all filled with anxiety, always wondering what's going to happen, why. Won't go to the cross, yeah. won't listen, won't learn, won't do. Struggling with, I don't know why I felt like going to church and maybe I shouldn't and I should come and, and I don't know. And what will people think? Why, why are you struggling with that? Yeah. I'm going to the cross. Preferring yourself. Yeah. That's all it is. Layers of rubbish. That's all it is. But God has called you to be a steward. To know the master's will. To know the master's word. And think of the kindness and humility of God that has made it available to you and I. As though we're anything that should have the knowledge of his will. The humility that God Almighty condescended himself, humbled himself to meet us and to present the gospel in a manner in which we can understand and gave us his spirit and we act as though we deserve it. He has given us his grace to be one with him, to, to know his will, to know his word. The power of His grace, the presence and power of God to be able to respond correctly to what He wants. To learn. He's given you the command, you follow me, is a command to be His steward. That you recognize that all that you have externally, and we think have, it's usually the sticks and bricks and all the finances and, and things that we have. All, the, all that we have, all that we are, belongs to Him. Your obedience belongs to Him, yes? Yes. Your trust belongs to him, yes? yes. Your, the love, the uh, adoration, the worship belongs to him, does it not? Yes. All of it. That we belong. I'm a good steward, so how many more breaths does Gary Cody have before I take my last breath? And what will be the words on my last breath? Should God give me? Could be in a car, could be this, could be that. How many more breaths do I have to be a good steward of the breath that he's given me? To be a good steward of the eyeballs that he gave you. To be a good steward of the hands that he gave you. To be a good steward of the heart and the cares and concerns of others in the household of faith. How can we care for one another? To be a good steward. He's called to follow him. To trust him with all your cares and concerns. Would you even now give him your cares and concerns? Saying, you know what? I find myself like agitated or worked up or bothered or concerned or my mind is going towards. Give him, give him your cares and concerns right now. I found that almost 35 years ago that God Almighty came into my life and I could give him my cares and my concerns. But before I just said, yeah, I just give him all my cares and concerns, it's that easy. My layers of rubbish had to be dealt with. And sometimes I've seen people take a long time because they fight for that trash all the time. They love that trash heap. They love it. And it's coming out of the trash heap and allow God to build something wonderful in your midst. Going into Africa and seeing kids plowing through trash heaps looking for something to bring home to eat and to live with. Yeah. And we say, oh, I'm struggling. You and I don't know what that looks like. Go down in Mexico City where they're playing football games now in the stadiums. And you go to Brazil and you look at the beaches, but you go behind the mountains and you see what they're living with. And you go into the gangs and you see all the, all the slum areas and you see all that they're dealing with. And, and oh, when they wanted to bring the Olympics there, all the cleanup they had to do to drive the gangs and the homeless and the, and the poverty away to try to make Brazil look wonderful. But in actuality, they're plowing through their trash heap just for something to eat. And sadly, I find the saints of God have been struggling for years living in the trash heap, going through and refusing to let the Lord go through their layers of rubbish to get to the cornerstone. But it can happen, quick. Yes. He's got a big shovel. He's got a big bulldozer. And he'll make all things new. And that's what he's gonna do with this entire world. All things new. Come and plow it out, all things new. Fire coming, destroy, dissolve everything. And uh, what did Peter say? Who said? 
What did Peter say? When, I, when all these things are dissolved, what manner? Who said that? The one who heard, you follow me. Yes. That's the one who said that. That's the one who wrote those letters. That's the one that said and wrote all those things and how to learn, how to learn knowledge. And Who wrote that? Peter wrote that. How did he write that? Oh, the Holy Spirit must have brought him to a cave and taught him. <laughs> no. Foot by foot, step by step, brick by brick, statue by statue, precept by precept, by the grace of God, he became a good steward of God's word. You and I are called to be good stewards of God's word, good stewards of God's spirit, good stewards of all the salvation he's bringing into your life. Not only are you called to be a good steward, but you're called to be and commanded to follow, to you follow me, is a command to be his saint. Not just his steward, but his saint. Great multitudes followed him, yes? Great multitudes followed him until he started talking and offended them with the whole idea of eat my, eat my flesh and drink my blood. They're pulled back. That's a hard word. That's a hard saying. How will we respond to such a hard saying? Let's leave them. So if a pastor all of a sudden has a hard saying for you, let's leave him. And how many have done so? Hard saying. How many pastor safari has seen walk away from him because, no, that hard truth. Give me the soft truth. That's what they say. Give me the soft, soft truth. Lies always despise the truth, no matter soft or hard. I was watching with Kara MasterChef last night. Long night. No, there's a <laughs> watching Master Chef. Gordon Ramsay's coming out. And he's taking their plates and pulling them apart. This is a this belongs in the dumpster. This is a piece of oh what a shame. You destroyed this dish. He is laying them out. One after the other, tears are coming out of their eyes as they, they're, they're, I wanted to be a master chef. I wanted to be a master chef. You said I'm ugly. <laughs> and destroyed those dishes. Crying, tears, bringing their dish back to their plate. I said, now if I'm a pastor and I'm doing that, it's, oh, he's harsh. Gordon Ramsay is, what a man. What a chef. <laughs> <laughs> it amazes me. Gordon Ramsay, who's tearing apart a cow with a knife and fork, is saying, Oh, this is your, this is an amazing dish. Gordon Ramsay commended me. This is a piece of trash. Takes it, throws it against the back lower, says, This is garbage. They're crying. Gordon Ramsay. <gasps> he gave me an apron. <laughs> God Almighty gives us a coat of many colors. God Almighty gives us the coat of righteousness. <clears throat> but if I speak like that, if I come forth like that, it's how harsh and how difficult and how can you speak that way? Pastors shouldn't say that. Pastors should be all the more saying that. Because we're not talking about a cut of beef. <laughs> we're not talking about how you cooked your broccoli and sprouts. We're not talking about the spice that broke in front and it turned into jello. We're talking about eternal life and eternal glory. We're talking about your life in heaven. We're talking about all things being dissolved. What manner of person should you be? We're talking about serious business. Not whether your crepes were too fluffy. <laughs> I tell you. <laughs> Jesus speaking to the young ruler. Remember he said, young ruler wanted to know, the rich young ruler. And Jesus, you follow me, hit his heart, didn't it? Because he wanted to justify himself. Wrong thing to do. Here's the Christ. Justification has come from heaven. There he is in front of you. But he wanted to justify himself. So Jesus hits him right where the problem is. Right where it is. Go sell all your stuff. Give it to the poor. Follow me. The great invitation. Dejected. Walks away. Why? Couldn't give up his stuff. 
Jesus hit right to the security problem. Jesus hit right to the identity problem. Jesus hit right to all of the areas that he used to lean on and lean to. Jesus hit right to all those areas where he justified himself. And Jesus hit to all those areas where he tried to vindicate himself and validate himself. And Jesus hit right to it. Does Jesus say, now for all of us to go sell our stuff and everything and give to the poor? Nope, that's not what he's saying. He hit upon the area of concern that was, that was robbing this man of eternal life. I wonder, I often wonder, like, for the rest of his life, how did that rich young ruler, how did he spend that knowing that word ringing in his ears? Pounding in his heart. All the time you, uh, you know that you have all your stuff and your servants and what to do and where to go and what you're buying. And you can have all the things around you. And you have the prestige and people are looking to you. And the poor people are looking for a handout from you. And Jesus told him, go sell it and give it to the poor. How can I not? How do you enjoy your stuff after that? Yeah. See how I said Jesus ruins your life? Jesus ruined this young man's life because he couldn't give himself away. He couldn't give himself to the Christ. But he said, you follow me. I've oftentimes heard people say, well, I'm not a follower. Yes, you are. You're just deceived to thinking that you're not. You all the time you see, be a leader, not a follower. And even our Bible schools were filled with trying to raise up leaders. No one's raising up servants or teaching servanthood. It's raising up leaders and, and the lead pastor. And oh, I'm just the pastor. Someday I could be a, what is it? A lead pastor. Because we need more leaders. We need more workers. We need more unashamed workers. Unashamed workers, as I preached earlier. To let go of all our stuff and, and foxes have their holes and dens, but you are going to follow me and I'm going to take you where you don't want to go. And as you've heard me say oftentimes, as I've reflected on my past, everything the Lord has had me do in ministry as a servant of the Lord for myself, this is personal, my own personal testimony, are all things that I did not want to do. Everything. Zion Bible Institute to go to college. I did not want to go to Zion. My pastor kept saying, you really should consider Zion. And, and the minute he said Zion, I just, I never even met the place, know nothing about it. I just pictured hoods and big beads. <laughs> Walking around. <laughs> <laughs> Chanting under the bell. I didn't want to be a bell chanter. I knew nothing about it, but I didn't want to go. And then all of a sudden the Lord's word came. That's where you're going. I put in a, I told you this, I put in a cassette tape. I've been listening to this cassette tape on a regular basis since being saved. All these songs that Carrie used to play that I couldn't stand, I now love. Something's happened. And I had just heard this, I just played the tape. And I got in from meeting with the pastor and he's saying, I really think you should come down to Zion. I really think you need to go to Zion. That's where God will prepare you for ministry. I don't want to go to Zion. I get in the car, turn the car on, and the thing comes blaring on louder than I play it on a song that it wasn't set on. You understand? Come on down to Zion. Come on down to Zion. Come on down to Zion, the city of our God. <laughs> I'm like, Lord. Come on down to Zion. I don't want to go to Zion. <laughs> and it has been that way. Coming here, yes, 2005. They need a pastor there. I'm going in as an interim pastor. My interim. 2005. My interim. 2025 is in a few months. My interim. I don't want to. And I walked in and said, the Lord, I turned to Kara and said, the Lord is doing something here. He wants me here long term. The Lord is doing something here. This is where he is. This is his work. And how many times did those who are still here from those days, and I said, if you do not obey the Lord, and if you do not come, and you do not follow, and you do not listen, then God will raise up a, children of gener a generation of children that will believe and will follow, and he'll remove you to the carcasses. And that's exactly what we've been seeing. Yeah. Yeah. Saints of God, this is serious business. To follow him is a command to be his sheep from the shepherd. That God Almighty has moved for you to be his sheep. Hear the word of the Lord. The Baha life is for you. You don't have that, that 
that life of the, of the one who's roaming about like a wolf. The power of the wolf is in the pack, as you oftentimes hear, but the power of the sheep is in the shepherd. That's from Gary Cody. And I'm telling you today that God Almighty is called from heaven and has called you to be his steward, his saint, and his sheep, his people. <clears throat> to follow his way, and he's made it personal. You follow me. His path, his victory, his freedom, his will, his spirit. You are his creation. You are his workmanship. By the Holy Spirit, he has put his hands into your life and he's forming and fashioning you to be like him. To not just be a steward, a saint, and a sheep, but to be one that is just like him. And you cannot do it without the word of God, the will of God, but you cannot do it without the grace of God. And that is only by the Holy Spirit and it cannot be obtained by our own works, but only by yielding and surrendering to the cross. You are called to be a follower of Jesus by the Spirit of God. I've never seen anyone who has given themselves fully to the Lord fall disappointed at the end of their day. Here I am myself at 35 years and I don't look back with disappointment with the should and could -haves. I don't look back over my 35 years and say, I missed God here and here. Nope. I can honestly tell you today before the Lord that I've been in the will of God. And it's cost me many a relationships. It's cost me much in that regard. And much, much sayings, not just here, but every place I've been, and it's been even used against me, saying, yeah, wherever he goes. Yep, so true. Thank the Lord. The word's gone forth. The call and the command from heaven to be a sheep unto the Jesus Christ. And this sheep is also one without teeth, but you better have bite. Because you belong to Jesus, you also have bite. Not the wolf bite, but the bite of truth. The bite of his humility. The bite of his power to stand fast and steadfast. Coming from heaven, this is a kind command. You follow me. This is a kind command that has come from God Almighty. A kind command calling you and I. It's kind. The kindness of the Lord has shown forth that he's made this opportunity to come forth from us. This is a deeply loving, think of it, a deeply loving command from heaven's heart. That he's allowed you and I to hear that and given us the grace to follow. You follow me. Hear him now. You follow me. Hear his draw. Hear that tug on your heart. You. You follow me. You. Come. Follow. Let go of the relationships that are hindering you and keeping you in the flesh. Let go of the attractions and distractions. The heaven's heart has called out and he's given you the Holy Spirit to respond with obedience and trust and say, yes, Lord. You might say, well, I'm too young. You may say, I'm too old. You may say, I'm too sickly. Yeah, what, that's all your what about and the what ifs and the how about instead of just, yes, Lord. The great opportunity for to follow Christ has come. The great God and Savior Jesus Christ has invited you to sit on His throne as He has sat on His Father's throne. That's kindness, is it not? And you say, but it seems like it's so far away. It's one breath away. Amen. It's not far away. It's one breath away. Just look how many keep dying around you. Look at the cemeteries. They're one breath away from seeing that experienced in your life. And you say, I have more breaths and more years to go, God willing. Then use them as good stewards to be a saint of the living God. Serve him with all your heart and be a sheep unto him that hears his voice. Yes. To follow him is to align your steps with him and follow him. And know that you're going to find that eternal hope that does not disappoint. To follow him is to stand and withstand. To follow him is to gain a clear conscience and a clean mind. Oh, to have a clean mind. To be purged of all of the lust and all of the jealousies and all the envies and all the distractions and to have a clear conscience and a clean mind. So wonderful. To let go of all attitudes that demand our own way. And you oftentimes see children. But oh, when you see an adult doing the same way, just more sophisticated. The life of the cross comes into your life and my life. You follow me. 
To follow him is to be with him, yoked with him, aligned with him. To follow him is to be his workmanship. And you're not shrugging off his hands, but you welcome the potter's hands. To follow him is directly leads to eternal glory, eternal life, and eternal reward, and eternal inheritance. To follow him and all that he has for you. To follow him is to live by grace, by his power, for his will to be done in your life. Hear the word of the Lord. Amen. Hear the word of the Lord. You follow me. Yeah. He has just excluded every other person, every other spirit, even all the angels of heaven. He just, you want to talk exclusion? exclusion? There it is. You follow me. Exclude every other mama and papa, every other word, every other uncle, every other uh, boyfriend, husband, spouse that denies Jesus or is struggling with. You follow me amen. in Jesus' name. Amen. To God be the glory. Yes. Amen and amen. God be with you.